This is a special broadcast of U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski's annual address to the Alaska Legislature, produced by 360 North and KTOO in Juneau. I'm Jeremy Shea. The Alaska Legislature is jointly convened this morning in the Capitol to hear from Senator Murkowski. She's Alaska's senior senator in Washington, D.C., and has been serving since her appointment in 2002. State legislature invites the congressional delegation into the Capitol each year to deliver these addresses. Murkowski is expected to speak for 30 to 40 minutes and to take questions from state lawmakers to round out the hour. Today is the 38th day of the 30th Alaska Legislature's second regular session. In the House chambers right now, we can see the combined staffs of the House and Senate getting together and legislators making their way in. The lawmakers have some procedural housekeeping to take care of before bringing Senator Murkowski into the chambers to deliver her speech. Murkowski has come up a lot in national news in the last year as a key swing vote in the Senate. Yesterday, I spoke with Alaska Public Media's Washington correspondent Liz Ruskin for some perspective. She is one of the very few remaining moderate Republicans. She's probably more moderate than many of the Republicans in the Alaska legislature would like her to be. She's been able to use that swing vote status to a bit of an advantage. It seems to have helped her get the ANWR legislation, the the legislation opening up the Arctic refuge to drilling. She seemed to be able to leverage her position as a moderate to get that in the budget bill. And that's been something on the Alaska delegation's to-do list for years. I asked Liz Ruskin what she'd be watching for today. I'll be watching to see if she says anything about raising revenues about taxes or anything like that, because, you know, the Trump administration has already taken note that Alaskans get dividends from the permanent fund, and they've kind of used that to say Alaska shouldn't get other monies from the federal government. So I wonder if she thinks it hurts her ability to get things for Alaska when Alaska hasn't adopted a broad tax. That was Alaska Public Media's Washington correspondent Liz Ruskin. Once again, this is a special broadcast of U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski's address to the Alaska legislature. We're live in Juneau. The Cap Alaska television crew is standing by in the Capitol, and we're waiting on lawmakers to finish up some procedural housekeeping to pave the way for the senator to deliver her speech. Senator Murkowski chairs the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and a subcommittee on Interior Department Appropriations. These are particularly important leadership positions for Alaska, but her reach has limits in this Congress, Liz Ruskin explains. She has an energy bill, a bipartisan, I mean, a really bipartisan energy bill. She hasn't been able to pass that, so she would really like to do that. It's interesting, I noticed Don Young said the other day that Uh, because it has a Democrat's name on it. Murkowski worked with um, Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington State on the bill. And because Cantwell is associated with that bill, Don Young says he doesn't think it can pass the U.S. House. So I find that interesting that Murkowski is able to both leverage her position as a moderate Republican to get things, to pursue her agenda, and yet also in some ways... A moderate senator cannot get ahead in this Congress in some ways. Ruskin noted one other key accomplishment Murkowski played a part in in the past year. The road to King Cove. I think the whole Alaska delegation had a role in it, but I'm pretty sure that Murkowski pulled a lot of that weight being an issue for her. She's been passionate about it. And, you know, the Interior Secretary has agreed to put on that road. So that's a major... We're going to have to cut you off. It looks like the joint session is getting in the way. Please come to order. In accordance with the provisions of Uniform Rule 51, I turn the gavel over to the President of the Senate, the Honorable Pete Kelly. Thank you. Will the joint session please come to order? For the purposes of an address by Senator Lisa Murkowski to the joint body. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the Senate be waived and all members be shown as present. Without objection, the roll call is waived and all members are shown as present. Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. I move and ask unanimous consent that the roll call of the House 
be waived and all members be shown as present. Likewise, the House roll call is waived and all members are shown as present. Will Senator Gardner and Representative Chenault please escort Senator Murkowski to the chambers, please? Floor is mine. Yes. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, it is good to be back with you. It's good to be, it's good to be with all of you again. Um, Fifteen years now. It's hard to believe, but that uh, this is now my fifteenth address to the joint legislature, and I still get nervous. I speak an awful lot, and I speak to substantial crowds. But I think it's because it's so meaningful to be back home, to be with leaders around our state, and to be reconnecting or, or reengaging in ways that are positive. So know that my time here with you this morning means a great deal to me. It means a great deal to be with friends. So I'm here to talk about what's going on in Washington, D.C., what's happening here at home and how they intersect and connect. Before I get into my remarks, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your service. Uh, we all know that the job is hard. We know that the hours are really long. The, uh, the efforts that you make individually and collectively to take the best ideas and to bring them together. So my, my hope this morning and my encouragement this morning is to, to work together, to find the ways to come together across the aisle, across the chamber, whenever and wherever and with whomever you can. Alaskans expect this, and we know that we can deliver. We know because we've seen it time and time again. My friend Al Adams, always did this, and I would thank you. I thank you for honoring him, and I hope that his legacy continues to, to inspire all of us to be better for Alaskans. And uh, I think about Al very fondly. Another friend of ours, certainly a friend of mine, actually my former boss, my first boss when I was a legislative aide here in, in the legislature years ago, Joe Hayes our former Speaker of the House, has just recently passed. And so it's sad news, uh, sad news for many of us who called him friend and recognized his leadership. As I thank you for, for your efforts and your work, I also want to thank your families, because we all know that we are all much better 
because of the support, the love, and encouragement that we receive from our families. And most of you, most of you uh, do not have your family members here with you. They're, they're back in your districts, but they keep us going. They keep you going when the hearings run late, when the rhetoric is heated, and the sessions seem to go on forever and ever and ever. They are there, and we thank them for their support. So I want to personally give a shout out to all of your families. So you know that's leading up to my family report. You can't have, a, you can't have a, an address without the family report, and we're all doing well. Our older son, Nick, is now 26, and we all know what 26 means. You are now off my health insurance. He's finishing up grad school, which means that that 529 plan that we worked so hard to fill, that is now depleted, completely run dry. So it's a good thing he's just about done. Our, our younger son, Matt, is, uh, he's running the family small business up in Anchorage. He has, uh, he's been very anxious to see how the new depreciation schedules and the 179 expensing from the new tax bill is going to impact him and his business. So, you know, Mom, what have you done for me lately? This is, we're going to wait and see. Uh, Vern, he's probably not going to like me saying this, but it's true. He has now applied for Medicare, so we're right up there with you. And as for me, some of you are gasping like I'm sharing state secrets. I, uh, I passed a major milestone birthday this year, and I am now eligible for my OFL. Some of you know what that means. I want to thank the state of Alaska for ensuring that uh, I'm going to be able to fish and hunt for a long while, but thank you for that. And Vern and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary, so we're doing pretty well. And oh, by the way, yeah, that's a good one. So when you think about milestones and anniversaries and good years, and it was a good year for us, we had a good year as a state because we opened up Anwar. <laughs> Not a bad way, not a bad way to end the year. So here we are in February. As I walked in, the snow was starting to come down. It can be a little bit of a dark and a gloomy time of year. We're all waiting for spring, and oftentimes the pessimism about the weather influences our outlook on our work, and sometimes that can be pretty dismal. You look at the statistics as they relate to our unemployment, you look at the budget shortfalls that you all are facing. So I'd like to take my time this morning and focus on the good and the reason why we have optimism for Alaska's economy. So think about where, where we are right now. We've got new investment in our military, in, in the interior, up in uh, up at Clear and, and Isleson and, and Greeley, and I got all my interior delegation nodding their head approvingly. We have our near-term opportunities to refill taps up on the North Slope, significant for us all. We've got great um, excitement, I think, with mining, and whether it is the expansion at Fort Knox, whether it's the opportunities at, at Bocan Mountain, Graphite One or Donlin, we have, we have real, real potential there. Our tourism industry, our visitor industry is growing strong. Uh, we have a multi-year funding for highways from the FAST Act, giving us that reliability and predictability of, of funding source, which is so important. We have the growing benefits of tax reform for individual Alaskans and our business community. So when you think about all of these as they have been teed up. We've got, we've got glimmers of spring all around us. But there's more that we have to look forward to. Consider some of the other things that we have been focused on. Our passage of the, of the Alaska Mental Health Trust, the land exchange, and, and the opportunity to provide for, for timber industry and, and revenue for mental health. Senator Stedman, you worked with us for a long while on that. Of course, the continued progress that we have on the Alaska LNG line is significant. We have new broadband development and opportunities there. 
from the perspective of the Coast Guard, we've got deployment of new Coast Guard cutters, which for our coastal communities is going to be significant, not only for, for purposes of the, of the assets themselves, but what they bring to the community. Uh, we're leading the way. The state is leading the way when it comes to innovation of renewable energy microgrids. When you have the eyes of the nation looking at places like Cordova and say, what are you doing up there? That's good to see. We have a two-year budget deal to fund both our military and our critical programs. And of course, we have the ever-growing attention to the Arctic, including the priority and the need for, for icebreaking capacity and icebreakers. So with all of these things in front of us and more, I think we can imagine a, a, a pretty good summer ahead. And I think, best of all, our biggest victories that we have seen this past year came from perhaps the hardest place. And that has been our longstanding fight to gain reasonable access to Alaska's lands. And we have seen significant advancements working with this administration. We see the administration's commitment to help Alaska through its efforts to open up much of our National Petroleum Reserve after nearly half of it was closed off. We also see uh, through the administration's approach that they have taken with regards to the new OCS five-year plan, which should reopen our northern Arctic waters to responsible development there. And then, of course, the big victory. The big victory at the very end of last year through the tax reform bill that just so happened to include a second title, a very short second title, but incredibly significant title, which I had the opportunity to author, which opens the 1002 area to responsible energy development. That Thirty-seven years. Thirty-seven years in the making. We do things by the decades, unfortunately, around here, or so it seems. But that torch was carried by, by Senator Ted Stevens, it was carried by my father, by Congressman Young, by multiple governors, and by countless state legislators. Some are still here in, in the chamber. Many are no longer with us. But it was the ultimate team effort. It was the ultimate team effort. We never gave up. We kept the faith. And we finally succeeded. And now access to the 1002 area is law. It is in law. And that is significant. We also had another significant victory in our fight for reasonable access to our lands. And that is the land exchange between the Department of Interior and the good people of King Cove. And I will turn to my colleague here behind me here. This has been, this has been a personal effort for so many of us. I can't wait. I think we're all going to be lining up, but I can't wait to be there to turn the first shovel of dirt on this. And I am so pleased to be able to, to be here today and tell you that we are closer than ever to finally seeing a life-saving road. And I, I commend you all for working with the governor to help fund that. So I think, I think as Alaskans, we can feel that things are starting to turn around for us. We're starting to turn the corner here. But even as we are, are looking forward to the summer and what it might bring, right now, our reality is we are wading through the slush of early spring, and uh, we've got to get through that. We have to recognize that while these gains are substantial, these gains that I've just talked about are good, and in many ways they're historic, but they're still fragile. And they're not guaranteed and they're not permanent at this point. So as jubilant as I am about Anwar and King Cove and so many of the other successes that we have seen over this past year, I also feel obligated as I stand before you to express a note of caution. Because to a certain extent, and I've used this 
I've used this phrase before, but we've reached the end of the beginning, if you will. We've taken some of the hardest steps, but we cannot take for granted what comes next. So I would urge you to consider carefully how your actions and your policies attract investment and foster stability in the face of the constant efforts that we know we receive from outside to undermine any progress that we might wish to achieve. We're already seeing it. We're already facing lawsuits over King Cove, over the Arctic offshore. We will likely see lawsuits and other roadblocks for the 1002 area. And we have to take all of these seriously. So I would ask you this morning that you consider how we can partner together to ensure that Alaskans realize these benefits. As, as, as much as ever before, and you know we've come together as a state over the years, but as much now as we have ever done, we need to be speaking with one voice at the national level. We need to engage the administration. We need to participate in the regulatory process. And we need to work harder than ever so that our views, which Alaska's views, prevail. So in many, many ways, state-led advocacy is as important now as ever. The steps that we have, have taken to, reason, to gain reasonable access to our lands and our waters, this is one of the, the great stories from last year. And as we see them through, these efforts, I think, will, will work to not only protect lives, create jobs, refill taps, diversify our economy, but also help ease the budget deficits as the years go on. But we recognize that there's other resource issues that we face as Alaskans. One is right here in the Tongass, our largest national forest. Reasonable access has, has a direct impact on economic stability. And we know that whether you're in the Tongass or whether you're in the interior. So over the next couple days, I'm going to be going down to, to your area, Representative Ortiz. I'll be hosting the Chief of the Forest Service, uh, Tony Took. We'll be down in Ketchikan. We'll be on Prince of Wales Isle, you know, I guess, weather permitting. We're going to get there. We're going to be optimistic about it. But I think it's important for him to see firsthand how federal restrictions, including the roadless rule, are holding us back holding us back on timber, on mining, on renewable energy development. I believe, I believe that there is both room and need for all of those alongside tourism and fisheries in a sustainable southeast economy. And that's why I've been pushing so hard to restore balanced management. So hopefully we'll have a good couple days uh, down in, in, in southeast, south southeast. Another challenge. Whereas Lyman Hoffman, Senator Hoffman, is always on my case, what are you doing? What are you doing to reduce the cost of energy, particularly in rural Alaska? And we, we know that this is an effort that we must continue to address and address aggressively. We've been working through some strong partnerships. Uh, the Department of Energy has awarded, I just mentioned, pretty large grant for microgrid technology to Cordova, which really can serve as a model across our state. And I hope you recognize, I hope you recognize that when it comes to microgrids and the technology and the advancements that we are leading on, we're leading not only the country, we're leading the world. Others are looking to Alaska for that model. And so when I think about ingenuity and innovation we're leading it here, folks. There's a lot to be proud of there. Uh, we also, of course, have, have the legislation that I have worked on over the past several years, our energy bill, which includes federal financing for small projects uh, that would help facilitate some of the build out. This, this bill is now back on the Senate calendar. Um, Later this, this spring, uh, early summer, I plan on hosting the Secretary of Energy, Secretary Perry, up here to the state to show him how Alaska is really this perfect proving ground for clean, new, reliable, uh, low-cost energy technology. So we're looking forward to that. 
So moving from the resource side of things, as I am traveling around the state, uh, health care. Health care everywhere I go remains a priority. And here, too, we made some progress, but also in this area, we know that we have our work cut out for us in many, many ways. Some of the things that we have done, we deferred the 3% tax on health insurance plans that would have even further driven up premiums in our state, driven them up by more than $600 a year for the typical small group family plan. So we pushed that off. We deferred the Cadillac tax that would have affected more than 60% of the plans here in the state, including those offered by the state, by our municipalities, our school districts, uh, that again, puts even further pressure on all of your operating budgets. So again, that is off the table for, for the short term here. We repealed the individual mandate that was, that was punishing thousands of Alaskans who chose not to purchase insurance because they couldn't afford it. We extended the Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, for 10 years. So we got a full decade of, of certainty there for critical programs like Denali Kid Care. We passed a two-year funding uh, for the community health centers to keep these resources open and operating in our communities. And we also moved past the threats to Medicaid and Medicaid expansion, which have delivered coverage to more than 42,000 additional Alaskans. Now, I know when we, when we touch on Medicaid, um, you are grappling with a very real reality here in, in the legislature. $92 million uh, uh, in additional Medicaid costs. So uh, you know full well the challenges that we face there. And when, when we think about what is going on with health care, our, our real challenge, whether we are legislators, mayors, or, or, or businessmen, it is this relentless increase in, in health care costs. So we've been fighting over coverage. We've been arguing back and forth as to, as to the coverage itself. But we really have to focus on the cost of care. And we have to recognize that there is no simple fix for this. It's going to take a combination of policies at, at the local level, at the state level, and the federal level. And I, I have said that we need to come together as, as Alaskans to find Alaska solutions for us. We all say that we're just a little bit different up here, but the problem with us being different up here is the difference is, is our costs are so much higher than any place else in the country. So again, how we come together with the solutions, it's, it's going to be us working together. We need policies that will help us leverage creative partnerships between our providers and our payers, streamline regulatory burdens, invest further in telemedicine, pioneer new delivery models, create transparency for costs, coordinate the care, and, and get the cost of prescription drugs, of course, under control. And we must, we absolutely must confront the substance abuse epidemic that is literally killing our fellow Alaskans, our communities, and our budgets. Everywhere I go in the state, I, I see the impact that addiction is having on, on our society. I don't care what the meeting is. I can be sitting and talking with teachers, or I can be talking with bankers, or I can be talking with fishermen. And it seems that every single conversation, whether I'm in Kenai or whether I'm back in Washington, DC, every conversation seems to come back to addiction. We've now directed additional federal resources to combat uh, opioid abuse. We'll be sending at least $6 billion more for enhanced state grants public prevention programs, and law enforcement activities that are related to substance abuse, abuse and mental health programs over the next couple of years. But I think we all recognize that this is not just a matter of funding. Funding helps because treatment programs are expensive. We know we don't have the facilities and we don't have the mental health providers that we need. 
But it's more than just funding, and it's, it's a challenge, quite honestly, that requires each of us as leaders, as leaders to stand with families, families who have just been ripped apart, and help dispel the stigma that is associated with the disease of addiction. We have to acknowledge that addiction impacts all of us and that it is our friends, it's our neighbors, it's our coworkers who are struggling and we have to be there to support them. So there are multiple levels that we must, we must uh, focus on. Now friends, I cannot, I cannot end my remarks here this morning without briefly addressing the sadness, the sorrow, and the real anger, the anger that is out there around the country after yet another mass shooting in our schools. I was here in this chamber almost 19 years ago, and I was sitting right over in this area. I can remember, I can remember the horror that I felt when I first learned of the assault on the students at Columbine. And it was a horror and a helplessness because my kids were back in Anchorage and they were little guys at the time. But the helplessness as a mother, wondering whether or not my kids were safe in school, a place that should be that safe place for everybody. And since Columbine, what have we seen? We've seen a growing trend, a growing trend in mass shootings and greater violence in our country that is difficult to explain or to understand. And just as with the issue of addiction, there is no simple fix. We know that. We know that there's no simple, one easy answer for these acts of violence, but we do know we do know that we are failing so many with mental illnesses. And how we answer their cries for help before they do harm must be part of our solution and our focus. We cannot have continued congressional impasse where we have a tragedy happen, we all express our condolences, we then lock into our political stances and nothing is done until the next tragedy hits and then we express our outrage all over again. We cannot become numb to the violence that is around us. And if the senseless death of children cannot bring us together to find solutions, I, I don't know what can. So as, as Alaskans, as Americans, we have to come together to confront the violence that is in our society today. So I am ready to work with all of you. I am ready to work with all of you on the challenges that we face and to, to nurture the opportunities that we are creating for tomorrow. So you thought I was going to forget those that have traveled with me today, but I want to introduce a few key members of my staff who helped me do this day in and day out, helping us work on, on these opportunities and, and these tough issues that we face. We've got Connie McKenzie, who so many of you know, Connie is my Juneau District representative. Uh, she's a good point of contact for my local office here. Next to her is Layla Kimbrell. Layla is from Soldatna, but she's now up in Anchorage acting as my state director and is doing a great job for me. Fish on the end. <laughs> I would use his formal name, but I don't think you would recognize Mike Pulaski. Fish, of course, is my chief of st staff, hails from Anchorage, but has spent many, many, many hours and days and years here in Juneau. Garrett Boyle is next to, to Fish there. Garrett 
is from Uzinki and Seward. So we're getting some of our coastal communities there, but uh, Garrett is my legislative director and he's also my lead on healthcare policy. So we keep him a little bit busy. Brian Hughes is next to Connie there. And Brian is the staff director on the Energy Committee. He is from Anchorage, doing a great job for me. Uh, he walks in, we pass Anwar, you know, all is good. Uh, <laughs> but he couldn't have done that without the exceptional help of Annie Heffler. Annie is also from Anchorage, and she is one of my rising stars on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. So uh, I thank them for what they do. I want to acknowledge, though, an individual who is not part of that lineup, and I begged him to come. Some of you will remember uh, Chuck LaSchulte from the days that he worked here in Juneau as a reporter. Some of you uh, have had dealings with him on constituent issues over the past 27 years. Chuck LaSchulte is probably the greatest font of Alaska wisdom, political history, legislative uh, intent and background that you will ever find. After 27 years, he told me, I'm, I'm buying a little farm, and I'm going to go paint my barn and have a life. Uh, he's made a mistake already, because he's given me his cell number. <laughs> and I intend to use it, because he is better than any Google app or Wikipedia than I will ever find. And, and what Chuck LaShelty has, has done in helping us advance Alaska's efforts, I think, that deserves a round of applause to my friend Chuck. So know that we're all here to work with you and, and, and your teams. Uh, give us a call. You know how to get a hold of us. Send us, a, send us an email. But I think we know our challenges are real. They are daunting. Uh, but they're not things that we can hide from. Nobody expects us to do that. They expect us to, to work together to overcome them. Um, but again, find the good. Let's, let's recognize that our opportunities in this state are immense, and, and we have to work together to, to not only protect them, but to advance them. This is, this is an extraordinary place that we are blessed to call home. We're blessed to be citizens of, of the greatest state in this amazing nation. And I'm blessed to be here with you all. So thank you. And now we'll take questions. Senator Olson, where are you? You have a question. There you are. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator uh, Murkowski, we want to thank you for all the work that you've done, in this, especially during this productive year, realizing that the senator from Bethel and myself have been here for a number of years, and we've watched the attempts over the years that have been unsuccessful, and then finally we were able to see the 1002 lands in my area opened up, and thanks to you for, for my constituents as well. But the question I have for you today has to do with the um, graphite deposit you've already talked about there in my district up there northwest of Teller in that area. And currently I'm working on a bill to go ahead and try and facilitate that so that the uh, deposit can be uh, made to enhance the people's l lifestyle and level of living up there. Uh, Alaska has obviously one of the largest graphite deposits that are in the world and that currently we are 100% dependent upon China for those. Uh, you've talked about Bokan in those areas. Um, but my, my question for you has to do with what specifically is happening in Washington under, with your efforts to try and make this so that indeed it comes a reality within a shorter period of time and not uh, gets bogged down in some of the bureaucracy as well as the uh, challenges that may be out there from people that don't necessarily want that to happen. Well, Senator Olson, thank you. Thank you for the question, but thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, again, I think it's exciting what we have with our mineral potential uh, around the state. And we've, we have been here, particularly look, look at our, our region down here with, with, with Greens Creek, Kensington. Uh, these mining jobs are not only uh, good career jobs, but good for the region and, and producing a resource that the country needs. When you mention graphite, 
our reality is, is, is graphite has been identified as one of those critical minerals that we are 100% reliant on outside sources, China or others, for. You know, when you think about, think about where we were 15 years ago, we were talking about our vulnerability as a nation on other countries who we didn't like and they didn't like us, but we needed their oil. There, it was about a not quite 70 percent reliant on, on, on foreign sources, but it was right up there. That was not a good place to be from a security perspective, whether national security or, or energy security. We turned the tide on that. We have turned the tide on that in, a, in an exciting and a dramatic way. It's been one of those energy upheavals that they're going to be writing about in, in history books and what is happening in the United States. But at the, at the same time that we focused on doing better when it comes to our oil and gas potential, we've just kind of turned a blind eye to that other vulnerability, which is our minerals. We can't do anything without the minerals that allow us to, to be a, a competitive country. I mentioned the great prospects that we have within the renewable energy sector. If we want to put more wind turbines up, I'm sorry, you have to coat the, uh, the blades with, with some of these critical minerals that are not being, not being mined here in this country. So we've got a We've got a bill, our critical minerals piece, that we have been advancing uh, through the legislative process and have great support for that. It identifies and, uh, and provides for not only an inventory, but then how do we do more to, to allow access to these very important resources. The Department of Interior just issued last week, in fact, um, it might have even been at the first of this week, the, the, the list that we had requested of identification of these critical minerals, there's 35 now, that are important to everything from automobile manufacturing to make sure that your, your smartphone works to, uh, to, to you know, your, your lithium ion batteries, everything that, uh, that we rely on in so many different everyday applications. So, we're, we've been working with the administration on how to highlight this in a way that's going to make a difference for us. So graphite, graphite one's project is really exciting up there because we need graphite in so many different applications. And we have it in, in a, uh, uh, I guess, an intensity or purity, I guess, is what I'm looking for, that is, is quite exciting. And then think about Think about the opportunity. It's not just extracting it. Let's not be just the extractive state. Let's process it here. And we know we've got opportunities, whether it's down in Ketchikan, whether it's in Seward, whether it is in, you know, we could, we could develop new areas for, for placement of, of this processing. But let's, let's bring all of these jobs and make them happen here at home. So it's exciting, and I think it's, it's a positive factor that we have an administration that is really keenly focused on our shortfall when it comes to critical minerals. I'm looking forward to getting up there. Representative Wool, you had a question. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, for coming here and taking our questions. It's always great to hear from the Alaska delegation. Um, you partially answered my question already at the end of your speech. Um, and as a parent of two young girls, and like yourself, when the Columbine shooting happened, I was here when the shooting in Parkland happened, and I have two girls in public school in Fairbanks. Um, and you asked the question of, of what to do, and we all ask ourselves that question besides lowering the flag and raising it again later. Um, and I, as you can tell from my voice, I've been a little sick, and I was in the pharmacy recently, and I got some sinus medicine, and I had to show my license and sign a document. Or if I got an opioid, they would enter my name and the doctor and the pharmacist into a database. And we all remember the Tylenol epidemic when a mentally ill individual put poison in Tylenol bottles, and now we have childproof caps. So um, I think you answered the question, but it is now our childproof cap moment for gun violence and gun shootings? And if so, what do, what do you suggest? And 
I know this country does not have a monopoly on mental illness, but we do seem to have a monopoly on these mass shootings. So what do you tell a parent like myself who to calm my fears and what do you tell a parent like myself that doesn't necessarily want to turn schools, which should be for learning, into war zones? Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, it's a, it's a very thoughtful and, and clearly a question that, that comes from the heart. And believe me, I, have, I, I, I wrestle with this every day. What is the right answer? And, and again, I'll repeat what I, I, I said in my statement, that there is no one answer. We have to address the, uh, the issue of mental illness and, and how, we can, uh, how we can respond to the signals, uh, how, we can be, uh, how we can be a better, uh, a better support for those who uh, not only are clearly ill, um, but in many cases, are sending the signals that they're asking for help here. How do we come to, to knit that all together? And there are some, I think, some promising things that, uh, that we are, are coming to see. After the Columbine uh, tragedy, there was legislation that was put in place, and it was, it was called the Stop Violence Act. And it focused on basically securing our schools, putting more cameras in, uh, locks, um, lights. Uh, it was, it was um, you know, metal detectors at the doors. I'm with you. I, I don't want our schools to be a, a, a place where you feel like you are in in, on the verge of a lockdown at, at any moment's notice. Uh, uh, I don't want it to be that way, but I also want to make sure that our kids are safe. The, the reality, though, is that a focus like that is reactive. What are we doing to be proactive? And, and this is where I think we've got some momentum. Um, after Sandy Hook, uh, the parents um, many of the parents there who, who lost their children or who were Im clearly impacted by that tragedy came together with, with what they call Sandy Hook Promise. And, and it has really been focused on, on how we build the awareness, the assessment, and then the training uh, to, to, to pick up some of these, these signals. So if, if you're a kid and, and a classmate that you you see all the time is just things are not right. Something is off. Where do you go? What do you do? Well, you know, you're a kid. You probably don't do anything. But giving them a safe place to to report anonymously, whether it's through an app, giving them an, having the the, uh, the the network to 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 take what is coming in to provide for a better assessment. These are some of the tools that we need to be looking to. And we've got a, we've got a bill that we're uh, dropping this next week I'm, uh, that focuses on some of the training uh, part of it to, again, be more proactive. I was in Eagle River at the high school there day before yesterday. And I asked the student government class that was there, freshmen through, through seniors, I said, I'm going to go back to, to work in Washington on, on Monday, and people are going to say, what are you going to do to fix things? I said, where would you start? And it was interesting. Young woman raises her hand immediately and starts speaking about the focus on assessment and training and how in their school they, they have worked to help identify and then know where that safe place is to take that information to. I went from that meeting, just coincidentally, to go talk to the, to the FBI and to understand what it is that they do with this information. So this is, this is all hands, but it needs to be more than mental health. It needs to be more than the assessment and the training. And we know that we've got a NICS uh, uh, a data bank system that needs to be addressed as well. Uh, we have a bill that's called the NICS fix. And, and you know the fact of the matter is, is we don't have all of our federal agencies that are inputting into the NICS system so that we have current information, things like that are unacceptable 
in my view. That's the easy stuff that should have gotten addressed. And so there are, there are, are provisions that I think we can be looking to that, again, help on the mental health side, help with the assessment, help with the training side, uh, address the, the clear inadequacies that we have within our background check system, and, uh, and, then, and then deal in some of these other areas where we know we have way too many uh, open doors. What we cannot do is draw our red lines in the right now and say, forget it. I'm not even going to talk to you about that. I'm not even going to talk to you about that. Because if, if we get to that point where we cannot come together with the, the differing solutions and views on this and have the conversation, and, and, and again, we say we need to have a national conversation. Uh, we need to have that, that, that discussion. But you can't have a conversation if you have said, I'm not going to talk to you if you're going to bring this up. And I'm not going to be in the same room with you if you're going to bring this up. This is too important. We cannot have a continuing escalation of tragedies in this country. So we got to come to grips with things, but the way that you start is not by drawing red lines. I just don't think we draw them. So, wish I had easy answers. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Representative Sponholes. So you kick me out of here. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Murkowski. Um, some might also call this a public health issue. But I'm going to segue to health care. You referenced it um, earlier a little bit. You referenced our, our $92 million supplemental mm -hmm. budget with regard to Medicaid. And um, we've experienced growth in Medicaid both because of expansion but also in our traditional population because we're in an economic recession. We have the highest unemployment in the nation right now. And we also have people increasingly underemployed, which is one of those things happen when budgets, when we're in recessions and budgets are tightened. Um, so I have a sort of a two-part question, and they both relate to the Affordable Care Act. Um, one is, you, do you anticipate any effort to reshape or redefine Medicaid at all coming up again? Um, and then also, you know, with the repeal of the individual mandate, we have a, a group of people who've, who are continuing to be uninsured, and we need those people to enter the market. I know that Senator Collins has been trying very hard to identify a way to introduce sort of a, a bronze level. What's the status of that? Is there any hope, and can we help in that way? Well, yes, there is an effort to, to provide for that kind of lesser plan, if you will, focusing again on the priority for affordability. And, and, and again, when we think about where we are right now uh, with, with the debate over health care, to just say, well, we're just going to move on to other issues, leaves those families and those individuals who truly cannot afford that, that care. It's not that they don't want to. So repeal of the individual mandate didn't do anything within the ACA other than to say you're not required to, to purchase it. And so if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't purchase it, then you're not going to be fined. But everything else within the ACA stays. But the problem still remains that for these families who, who were paying the fine anyway, they still can't afford their health care. So there is an effort uh, that is underway to, to help uh, a, provide for a, a, a lesser plan. Uh, there are a couple other legislative efforts that, in my view, are going to be important to help stabilize the market. This is something that uh, I've been working on with, with, with the chairman and the ranking member of the Health Committee. Uh, Chairman Alexander and, and Murray have, a, have a, a bipartisan proposal that is out there that would provide greater flexibility to the states that, that would help with just this, uh, just with this effort. There is also another proposal that is at play, uh, also led by Senator Collins but with Senator Nelson from Florida that would take the Alaska model. They're all, they're all talking about the Alaska model and what you did with reinsurance. I know it cost you $55 million. That was a, that was a 
big commitment and a big decision. But I think we have seen here in Alaska how that has paid off. We just found out that uh, our numbers were a little bit off, and for the first time in a long time, it was off in our advantage. So we're actually going to be receiving more uh, coming back to us from that. So there are efforts. Uh, what you can do, speak up as a legislature. I think I say this every year that the resolutions that, that you provide us, um, when you can demonstrate a show of support in certain areas and say these are Alaska priorities, this, this helps us. Um, and I'm going to say the same thing to, to the mayors when I visit with, uh, with those that are gathered at, at AML uh, later today. So um, I, 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 would, I would encourage that push to us there. Um, okay, what was your first one? Medicaid. Oh, Medicaid. So do I think that there is going to be an effort to, uh, to revamp or, or restructure Medicaid? Absolutely not this year. Um, but you asked, you kind of left it open-ended. Medicaid, I think we recognize as the, as the, the program that it is, uh, having come about in the, in the mid-60s, um, we're looking at the sustainability of the Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, the entitlements, um, and, and, and realize that our demographics have changed in the past 50 years. And so how we make these programs sustainable into the future, this is a challenge to us as, as a Congress. Um, it's kind of like you all and, and dealing with things like, like pensions and things that you really want to just jump right into uh, because they're so easy to address. Um, these, are, these are challenges for us, but in the long term, we must. But I don't believe that you will see, in fact, I'm relatively confident that you will not see uh, an effort to to reconfigure or reform Medicaid in this in this congressional year. Yeah. Representative Seaton. Mr. President, uh, Senator, uh, thank you for your action supporting pulling back um, uh, the offshore uh, leases to the areas that have been traditionally leased that concern uh, so many Alaskans. And you're, you're familiar very well with our fiscal problem and our lack of revenue to support uh, the kind of infrastructure development that would take place. And so my question is, is what is the possibility of uh, Alaska getting that same 37.5% share of oil that uh, oil revenues from the offshore areas that Louisiana and the other Gulf states uh, share uh, instead of zero? Thank you. Well, thanks for the question, Representative Seaton, and, and know that offshore revenue sharing always has been and remains a top priority for me. Uh, that is something that we're going to, uh, hopefully you'll see us redoubling our efforts uh, with that, working with uh, other members from, from coastal areas. I think that that is, that's important. It's not just an Alaska uh, issue that needs to be addressed, but, but other other uh, states that have coastal offshore. I want to thank you for the resolution that uh, has come out uh, of the House here with regards to, to the OCS and, and the five-year plan. Um, I applaud Secretary Zinke for putting everything out there on the table. Now, there were some who said, oh my gosh, this is, he's, he wants to lease 95% of our offshore. Um, this is a little bit over the top. Keep in mind, what a, what a draft five-year plan is. It is a draft. There is a process. And, and so he began the first step. And the first step was to identify those areas that have the potential for leasing and have the public weigh in, have leaders weigh in, and then make a determination as to what should be reasonably incorporated within a five-year plan. But not everything that you put out there is going to stay out there. But unlike the previous administration, who took a very narrow view to what should be included in any five-year plan, they had identified a few, few small areas, put that out, and then from there, they took off. Because what happens within the, the, the formation of these five-year plans, you can't add anything on once that draft has been laid out. You can only take things off. 
So don't start with a very narrow base and then get it so skinny that you really can't do anything to benefit anyone. Let's start with a full meal deal, put it all out on the table, and then figure out what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. As a congressional delegation, we looked at it and said, hey, we want to send a strong message that let's focus on the areas of highest interest. We certainly know the potential for us in, in our Arctic offshore. Uh, there's been ex exploration back in the 80s. Uh, just because Shell is not there right now does not mean that we don't have opportunities. Cook Inlet has been producing for us for 50 plus years. So let's make sure that these are on the table. But we also suggested that some of the other ones are not ready for prime time. So the secretary will take that into account. We had public hearings in Anchorage yesterday, I think it was. Um, and those hearings are going on all over the country. And so from that informed process that will take months and into the next year, the, the, the Department of Interior through the Secretary will make a determination as to what will be included in the final five-year plan. But remember, it's a five-year plan. So if we decide, you decide, seven years from now, gosh, we've got extraordinary potential over in this area, we weigh in again. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the direction that they have taken. I'm pleased uh, that that we've seen the level of, of public comment that we have, that will continue. Um, but in the meantime, what we need to be doing, what your delegation needs to be working on back in Washington, is to make sure that there is that level of equity when it comes to revenue sharing, as the Gulf of Mexico has, so we should be able to share in that. And it's not just the, those actual revenues, it's what we're trying to build into that, which will allow for uh, greater resilience uh, tribal resilience funds. We incorporated it in in draft legis in, in legislation that we have introduced. So, looking to do even more beyond that to provide for for benefits to the impacted areas and states. It is uh, it's now moved up on the priority list once we get some of these other ones that are taken care of. So, we got time time to focus on that one. Senator Murkowski, thank you so much for coming to visit us. Yeah. Good to be with you. That was U.S. Right. Senator Lisa Murkowski live from the state capitol in Juneau. She's going to be making her way out of the room and we'll have live coverage on Gabba, Alaska of her regular press availability shortly. We expect to hear from Alaska's junior senator, Dan Sullivan, next week. This special coverage was produced by 360 North and KTOO in Juneau. I'm Jeremy Shea. Thanks for joining us.